Thank you for coming and supporting the Montana Book Festival. I'm your moderator today. My name is Andy, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Ann Holub and Kara Chamberlain. Everybody, please give them a quick round of applause. Today's event is What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger, poetry about sex, death, and the natural world, my three favorite topics. Uh, I'm going to start off with some uh, biographies of our poets today, and then I'll pass it off to them for the reading. Ann Holub is a graduate of the University of Montana's MFA program in creative writing. Her poetry has been featured on Chicago Public Radio and Yellowstone Public Radio, and in various print and digital publications. Her debut poetry chapbook, 27 Threats to Everyday Life from Finishing Line Press, was a semi-finalist in the publisher's 2021 New Women's Voices chapbook competition and contains her poem, Mudslides, which was awarded runner-up in the 2022 Mountain West Writers' Contest by the Western Humanities Review. Kara Chamberlain is the author of Hidden Things, The Divine Botany, and Lament of the Antichrist in a Secular World and other poems. Her poetry has appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including Nimrod, Boston Review, The Southern Review, and po Poetics for the More Than Human World, an anthology. She lives in Billings, Montana. Miss Karen, I met in Billings, and I twisted her arm to submit her books. I'm so glad that we're both together here on this panel and survived the weary drive over the continental divide yesterday. Oh gosh, I gotta try to do this one-handed. That's gonna be fun. Let's go. Wildfire. Sunrise in fire season and we've already choked back smoke from the window panes. This is the time the wind quiets, the heat not yet a force that can lift. Help us to understand the speed of it all, as if a conflagration could be easily mapped, marked, clocked, a radar gun aimed at the trees cresting the dry hill behind the house. The dogs cough to be left let outside. You know where they're heading, bellies flat in the crawl space, slowly digging their way under the porch tinder to moan. This is the history of the camp, before that, the Okanoan complex. Before that, the summer Yellowstone burned, the rattlesnake and the man gulch, the one they jumped and lost. Call this a warning or a watch. Call it man-made or an act. What brings more danger, the color of the sky in morning or the ash on the car where we can write a name? Who can, who can we pray to when we don't dare light a candle, when summer rain would bring lightning and kindle? What can we do but dig in the dirt and hold the line? So this next poem I wrote and really kind of became a I guess a keystone for the the collection. I wrote it um, at F the Flathead Lake Bio Station, which I was very lucky enough to be a part of um, a cohort with the open air writers and residents there um, in spring of 2019. And um, we got to share uh, the peninsula on Easter with um, a mother bear and her cubs. Bears. There is a bear over the hill Skinny from winter and milk sore, with claws and fur full of pine and the smell of last fall's blind gorge. Hyperphagic in October, she'd crossed the highway after dark, eyes reflecting the moon. She was pregnant then, even she knew it, could tell she needed more food than a few rose, a few rose hips that soured on her rough tongue. She raided the orchard for fallen peaches, ate cherries left to wither, scraped the roots of skunk cabbage between her teeth and smelled for viscera left rotten. She scavenged deer, plucked porcupines roadside. She waddled. She reveled in her fat, licked blood between her claws like jam. There was a bear over the hill. After the last night of frost, she dug into a wide trunk and slept. 
She laid her wide head against the same soft wood she'd grubbed out and smoothed with her pads. Over her head, the snow began. It clung, barked, and westward facing. It drifted over her dreams. They called it a blanket. It was quiet. She missed months of sunsets. In the spring was the cub's insistence. The twins rolled inside her as the ice cracked, tugged her insides like the buoy chain, snapped her slumber. They forced her eyes awake, her lips curled back into a yes. There are three bears over the hill. The drifts cleared, they emerged with a newfound love of wind and the sound of the lake lapping rocks. They learned to run, to fall in the sand. She licked their faces clean, showed them logs and beetled bark. The larches greening herald the fat bulbs of glacier lily, the sedge, the cow parsnip. They dug cold earth, scooped mice into their mouths, played with them like toys and crunched small bones that popped and gave way. I know there is a bear over the hill, a slightly darker shape in the shadow of the cabin. She smells the door at night, tests its strength like a strange key, and wakes me from sleep. She is hungry, and she is not alone. So this next one is the only um, form poem I have in here, and I'm uh, it's it's uh, the first and only Sestina I've I've written, so I was super psyched with it. Um, this is uh, Mesothelioma. They said it wouldn't burn, but we could feel it like a blanket smothering us from the inside out. They said it was safe. It wasn't enough to just send us to gather it in the mine. Every day we brought more up in our breath. Men stacked fish deep in an elevator, sucking shallow breath, worried their dark thoughts will ignite and burn. The weight of the darkness like a blanket in your pockets, wearing out two holes where your hands hid, safe from your shaking eyes as you shuffle into your shift, they're mine. That's a funny thought, that it's mine, not theirs. But your breath is only yours, like a match you burn against the cup of your hand, an old blanket of stars, familiar as a thumbprint. Set out to find something new, and you'll lose what's safe. That's what she says every time you're home safe. Praise God and let the devil know you're mine. You can feel her hot breath on your neck as you sleep, as your thoughts burn against the light, like moths birthed when you fold the blanket. Try to set things right in a square, smooth them out, and make something better than what sifts out of the rail cars into what sits dusty in a safe. You can tell them at the mine about your children, their sweet breath whistling as you inhale every day like a burn across your lungs, a blanket over your chest. Time weighs like a rotting blanket and stones you can't piss out. It holds you down with the irony that keeps others safe, but not from dust you dig from the mine. It wasn't your windows fogged with winter breath, but your lungs that will slowly frost and then burn. They sold your breath in the mine, abandoned you like a babe in a blanket and called it safe. The doctors cannot take it out. You can only sit and burn. This last one um, I wrote after a summer in Chicago where I lived in between my stints in Montana. Dive. What handsome lies we tell ourselves in summer. Slick patches darkening under arms, between legs caught too long against vinyl seats. 
released from a long drive, the promise of destination, with sucking sounds like a cap opened slowly, like some foreign filament stuck between your teeth that you just can't give up on. Gazes adjust from above the water to catch shadow from a darker patch of light. How deep is it here? Could we leap from rocks and blow small bubbles skyward until our feet land silted in the crushed sand atop the bodies of ancient phytoplankton that fell too far below the surface, those unlucky ones that caught the wrong current that couldn't reach the light? If we dove headfirst, would we break our necks? What caution are we throwing to where our mothers stand, trying not to look concerned? We should hold a rope and ease in, form a human chain and shuffle feet, one, two, until someone kicks a lump of something no one, nobody wishes to find. Thank you for coming, and um, wanted to thank the Montana Book Festival and the library. It's a beautiful library. Ours in Billings is nicer. But <laughs> now this is a beautiful view. Um, Billings is a place filled with people who want to live in Missoula, <laughs> or Bozeman, um, but not Billings. Um, <laughs> so I get some weird ideas, and so the idea behind this book was to write love sonnets, because I've always loved the sonnet and had it a really hard time writing sonnets. But then I thought, well, what if animals wrote sonnets? What if they wrote love sonnets? So I don't know. That's where this came from. And uh, so I'll just read a few of these. And they're, they're sonnets, sometimes more or less. But they're 14 lines, so that makes them sonnets. Chickadee Love Song, parts one and two. One, when I grew more brain cells, I brought even stars to orgasm, tunes pricking under wing night like thorns. Hey, baby, to every girl. Oversexed and overcharged, I was a twit, hawk heckled too. I went darting from twig to branch. There were a hundred guys like me, complete maniacs, hormonally wild. Those women so self-absorbed, dresses cloud white, current black, the hard, snide lobe of their critic minds measured my gifts, and they weren't impressed. God pitied Job's boils, but the women hardly looked at me. Two, she hardly, but one final snap from her, she's in my pumping wings, the wreath of my fan tail, Hearts fast as hailstones, cloaca everting an amazing vent, genius song, a hip-hop score, greatest of all time, skin to lures, lick of primaries, coverts, the cupola of plumage I grew for this, a second or two on the bow, before the cat schemes a kiss of destruction. Just a few will fledge, but aren't we something? <laughs> um, each poem has a little sort of explanation, which is more, it's a prose explanation and more scientific. Um, and some of these I won't read. Um, and I'm not going to read the one for the chickadee, because I think it's pretty obvious. But um, And the elk love song, at least for people who live in Montana, it's probably obvious. Um, but I guess I should say that male elk don't live very long. They're they spend so much time fighting each other and trying to keep their harems uh, together that uh, they live about half as long as a female elk. So a lot of people, I think, in Montana think the bull elk is the epitome of power. And um, I don't know. <laughs> Leave that up to you to decide. Elk love song. Flutist of the avant-garde. Biggest. Worst threw away his freedom, doesn't eat or think. Quick to take offense, he drives us higher, faster, lunging if we stop too long, nap or scratch. 
He raises his head to smell our pee, and paranoid, he doubts our loyalty. Mr. Sensitive. Crisping days make him even worse. We just want to get by, use him to keep the young guys off. He mounts earnestly, drops the fluty bedroom song. When we give him to winter, he's ghostly. By spring, calves will graze through his bones. Um, so a lot of Anne's poems feature the dangers that people face from animals. Um, but I focus more on the dangers we pose to other animals. Um, so one of the sad stories um, that I read about was um, this, and I'll, I will read the little prose introduction or postscript first so the poem makes sense. Captive in a Chinese zoo, the only known female Yangtze giant softshell turtle, at 81, perhaps the last mother of her species, and her older male companion have not produced viable eggs. Two males remain in Vietnamese zoos, but political differences between the two countries keep these duos separated. Artificial insemination, therefore, may be the species' only means of survival. This is Yangtze giant softshell turtle love song. Four, three males and me at the end of time. It's so mundane, eat, drink, swim, bask in the prison yard. And it's not so bad, the captive state. Ground meats suit me. I never ask for more. Prison is politics. So the keeper goes on about the tasks of small souls. My companion ages incapable. We nod and we go on as well. What sorry circles, really, we describe in the mucky, stultifying pond they made for us. It's been years. Back and forth, sunning, celibate, not by design. We're staring at extinction. You'd say, I don't know the unfertilized ache. Um, so you may know about anglerfish, but you may not. <laughs> um, anglerfish live way down in the depths of the ocean. And so life there is not very rich. There aren't many other anglerfish for a girl looking for a date is going to find, <laughs> or a guy looking for a date is going to find. Um, so when they do run across each other, um, the males are tiny compared to the females, and that's true of a lot of species. The males are much smaller. Um, so the male will actually burrow into the female flesh and become part of her and basically be dissolved except for his, um, you know, sexual organs. And so they never have to worry about finding a date again because there they are. <laughs> so this is called Anglerfish Love Song. Pressure, that darkness, cold, empty depths, no place for regret. I followed my light, the blue mark he read, come and be kept. Frozen mako, diatom rain, once bright, now dead, falling through my ragged row of teeth. Sometimes I danced for the viper fish, sometimes for myself. I whirled under the undertow, lured and scarfed whatever passed. Sun's swish he came, bit down, embedded, we fused. He disappeared in me, all but his testes. I'm not sure I felt the next crawl in and like the other become my flesh, my loves, my parasitic boys, I've got you or you seized me more than husbands under my skin. And um, I think I have time to read this. This is the poem that really started me on this, this uh, track of weird animal love poems. Um, is I saw on the internet, you know how you just, one thing leads to another on the internet. So somehow I ended up looking at this um, picture, there were a series of pictures of a forlorn male swordfish 
whose mate had just been caught and, you know, taken out of the sea. And um, it was a very sad story to me um, and really beautiful pictures. So I'll just read the, the epigraph, which explains the photo or the, the series of photos. The photos taken from a boat in incredibly clear water are poignant. From 10 meters underwater, fishermen hoist a female whose body cavity is visibly dilated to release eggs to the surface. As they do, a male, unrelenting in his courtship, accompanies her forced descent and swims at her side. Um, and that's from Scientific American. So um, anyway, the other thing you have to know is that the Again, like anglerfish, the female swordfish is a lot bigger than the male swordfish. And Hemingway liked to kill swordfish, but he didn't know that. So he thought he was killing the big males. He was actually killing the big females. This is a series of seven poems. The he fish. She bursts, blushing, fading through shallows, pulled by mechanisms beyond reason, light, hard, and no return, a gallows where ambition dangles. To the myth of seasons that sometimes infects our darkness, darkest richness of with algal choke, dead calm or purulent storm, up they haul her. Pectorals taut, priceless, heated brains, desire, lover I'd kill for, we all would, shark. Marlin, novelist, goddess, goddess, mother, world, death, her side so long and shining, her blue eyes missed my deficiencies. Now she's apotheosized where milt won't. Me, a wuss, damn skipjack, I pray her back, the he fish. So I lose my faith. There is no back, there'll be no eggs, my circling holes. A wraith of what I might have been, final days, masculine, punk, useful only with her, superfluous and cheap. I bobble near her last blurred struggle, its imprint deep. Shall I tell you her passion, diamonds fracturing as she fought? Her inclination, I flatter myself, was to shine for me, caught and hooked. She writhed, stabbing, what peak? My flesh proved weak. The he fish, she died. Strange nowhere jolting her away. I hate to think of out there. I pray close by, should she break free, I'd attend to her. But in truth, I drift into the larger bent, the sea's wish to which I fit. I knew her gills, scales, glisten and tail, knew her as the incandescent sense, caudal perfection, salvation of males. She died for my sins, how trite. As much as me, she wanted that procreative spin. The photographer. The morning mail, I digitize. One 32nd hundredth of a second, flashing in vertical duo with his love. Their tragedy, I'll caption it. A small beacon in an otherwise incomprehensible sea. Sometimes I think of myself as a voyeur, turning to design another's grief. They're just fish, it's true, and to be sure, this is art. It's hard to be detached, working the worst conditions, sometimes a wild storm, then matched with this mechanism I've beguiled myself into believing is self-aware in love. What of this disaster can I bear? The remora. You know what a remora is, right? They're the little fish that stick on the bigger fish and ride along with them. The remora. As the girl I clung to goes through closed gates of the world, not one of those involved has a clue about my disaster, not even, I'll guess, her. Call me swordfish sucker, remora, hitchhiker, and general adventurer. She seemed a good bet, vast and smooth. I liked her right away, and so I stuck myself on, dreamed we'd go forever, plunging benthic pressure in ways I'd never dare alone. I hung to the gills held there, then, bless her, slid to a flank. For years I clung, but now my vessel, my captain, I'm off to find new friction. The sport fisherman. For that alone, I booked this trip. No more stupid office geek. Brochures promised a boat, some sun, a bit of ego building sport, a manhood tweak. I'm seasick. Things were okay until we hooked the fish. Now I'm supposed to be quick. 
Like they say, be careful what you wish. I did research tied to chair. Some Hemingway types broke their arms, wrangling their trophies of a lifetime. Hyperbole, I thought, and laughed. Harm is this monster. Can't stop. The devil's due. I've paid for a damned photo op. The she-fish. Someone else's voodoo. I twisted, pulled, fought harder than a crew of men. I lost. And my Andromeda cloud of eggs is lost. Metaphor and real, part for the whole, that's me. A symbol, dying oceans, human greed. All I want is this hook taken out, to swim back with the foolish spawning boy. How touching that he follows. Sword aloft now, gills reaching, useless, the air crush caving in. I never thought I'd leave the sea, begin punching sun. A heat we only tell of, the goddess's destiny, blistering. So we were um, uh, talking about how our books are similar and, and different. We both obviously have some scary stuff going on. But um, uh, a lot of what I was writing in 27 Threats was about uh, these things that have scared us or keep us from going out in the world or interacting with people. When I first moved to Missoula, uh, 22 years ago for school, I was terrified about hiking by myself. And I w came from a place where um, hiking wasn't something you just did kind of casually. It was, I grew up in Virginia, and we'd have to, like, get your stuff, drive away as you know, go. It wasn't just going out your back door. Um, but I was convinced that I was going to get kidna kidnapped on a hike um, by some mountain man. Um, that was where my brain went. It was very like National Enquirer. It was it was very like uh, out of the world of logic, but that kept me for a full year from ever going on a hike by myself, and um, I missed out on a lot of things in that first year. So um, I started thinking about well, you know, as as women, we have a lot of very valid fears about being out anywhere by ourselves. Um, and then it came down to, well, or we should be afraid of the person we're in a relationship with, or we should be afraid of trying something new because what could happen? And so um, a lot of what I was trying to write about was, is it more important to understand what you're afraid of um, or, and identify it and understand it from a scientific point of view, or is it more important to just not be afraid um, and I think that those are questions that we deal with all the time in daily life. Um, one of my, my pure, like, animal poems that we were looking at, maybe um, it would be, like, similar to the swordfish poem, is about triggerfish, which when I learned how to scuba dive, all the training is like, oh, this is going to be fun, but here's, like, 15 ways you could die doing this fun <laughs> hobby. And one of them is triggerfish, which are so territorial that they will peck at your eyes and your head and your mouth, like anything that isn't protected, if they think you're encroaching on their babies. Um, and their um, uh, area, like we would, under okay, if I back away or if I swim up to safety, um, I'll be okay. But their um, territory is not round, it's actually vertical. So it has you go up to try to get to like terrestrial plane, they are, you're still in their way. So it's, it's actually very terrifying. It's just one of the many ways you could die doing scuba diving. I still do it. But uh, it was, it was, it's just like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there. And if we just look, well, then I'm out. You know, if we tap out at any chance, then you're not going to do anything. Um, and so, uh, but at the same time, there's all this stuff that we interact with that's like absolute magic, um, doing all these things that are super terrifying. And I think it's important to find some sort of middle ground where you're going on the hikes and being safe and being smart, but also like um, having those experiences. And I think that that's also something that's taken me a long time to kind of get around to as well. And then and Kara's book, um, and, and, and you can talk a little bit more about this, like it was dealing with the human interaction with nature and how we sometimes mess everybody up. So I'll let you, I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, one of my favorite poems is um, Corson's Inlet by A.R. Ammons. And he has a line that's, um, I think, really great for someone who suffers from anxiety. 
Um, <laughs> this is nature, terror pervades, but is not arranged. So at any time, anything can happen to you, but it's not arranged, which to me is less frightening than humans arranging terror. Like and, uh, guns and... Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Or living in a dictatorship or something like that. So when you go out in nature, it's chance. But when you interact with humans, sometimes it's arranged your like, your harm. But. Like your your mother saying, "Oh, you know, just don't just ignore it. It doesn't want anything to do with you." And you're like, "Yeah, but I still got stung." Like, yeah. Um, and you know, you'd be prepared for that. But yeah. so, do you have any questions for us? Oh, so it's better. Okay. Um, my question was for Anne, and I wondered if you could update your, um, if you think about the list of poems, like which, is, is there a poem that wasn't written about what you're afraid of now, <laughs> or a poem that you were like, oh, wait, I've actually made myself afraid oh, writing yeah. this poem? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wrote um, a, a poem that I did not read about the 1976 flooding in Big Thompson Canyon in Colorado, and I was I was maybe going to read it, and I didn't. It's in the book. You can check it out. Um, it's still the most deadly flood in Colorado history, um, and it was basically a flash flood in a box canyon that happened at night, and it killed 144 people. It injured 250, and six people are still missing from it. And it just happened. It was 12 inches of rain that came down in about two hours in Loveland, Colorado, and... Um, and that was 1976, and we literally snap on the TV all the time, and it's like, disaster. There was an earthquake in Morocco this morning, and we're at 1,000 so far with that. And, you know, it's just like, disaster, disaster, disaster. So, like, there is so much more to be afraid of because of the 24-hour news cycle. That didn't really exist when I first started some of these poems. Um, and I think that, like, travel is really good, f that whole, like, demystifying and embracing cultures and difference and wonder and like what is it going to be like and I don't speak the language and all these kinds of fears that come into play and it also gives you um this kind of greater global empathy to people who are like dealing with climate change dealing with impacts that we don't necessarily feel in in this um great first world country and stuff like that so yes there's a lot of things to be afraid of it's kind of like this could be part one of 27 itself so um yeah but um there's i think uh, also as a person living with anxiety um there's a lot of kind of a well your chances are never zero for like anything that's going to happen and you just kind of go through life like that and just have a first aid kit and be smart so it's kind of you know good the question all right i've got a couple so if you have a question just raise your hand i'll bring the mic over to you uh this is a question this is for both of you um a lot of the events this year have to do with the intersection between science, ecology, and art. Could you speak a little bit about how you feel about that intersection in your own work? Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess if you are alive these days, you are bombarded by science, whether you want to be or not, because it's, I mean, science and technology, AI, I mean, all of that stuff um, is a, affecting us all the time. And it's also a double-edged sword. We could use science to help save us, and we can use it to help destroy us. And that's, I think, where art comes in to help us understand how to ethically use the knowledge that we have and to um, direct technology in ways that are beautiful and not harmful. And so as writers, I think we have to write about those things because that's our obligation um, to the world and to ourselves is to try and figure out, well, how do you survive in 
a world where we know so much, but we don't always use that knowledge effectively, I guess. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think that uh, this is like the second time this week AI has come up. Um, and as writers, it's it's a little shaky ground, right? We're, we're like, oh, I don't want my job to go away. Um, and I think that there's there's so much with science that I mean, I've always been someone who learns as I write a new topic. And so even with poems, I love an encyclopedia or God bless the internet. It's just opened up. It's like so much faster just to get um, all those great. So I'll be like, I'm going to write about um, a mountain and I want to make sure I'm describing a goat the right way. And so I'll go and like research goats or something. Um, and I think that having all that information, yes, is, is like the world we live in and we have to decide how we're going to use it. And that intersection with art is, and, and being a creative human with human brain parts um, versus an algorithm is still, you know, right now, a unique thing that we get to hold on to and that that secret sauce is still like locked in to being a human person and we get to create something really magical that hopefully right now um, chat GBT isn't going to be able to do. And I think that embracing it, like I love AI tools. I love my Shazam app. I love the bird ID. I live for it. Um, but it's also wrong a lot. Um, so I'm like, yes, humans for the win. You know, I can figure it out. So I think learning and growing and creating art are still like so vital for us to be who we're going to be. And when we stop, that's really when the machines are going to take over. Yeah. All right, I've got another one for both of you. Um, your work kind of deals with this delicate balance between the beauty of nature and what we might perceive as the grotesque aspect of nature. Uh, how do you approach balancing beauty and, and the grotesque in your work? Um, I didn't read the tick poem on purpose because I read it once and people literally were recoiling. Um, we both have tick poems in this book, just so you know. Um, it's one of my friend's favorite poems, but it uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, make people feel comfy. Um, uh, I think that it's really important to have those moments. I was just starting a series on Netflix, um, and I gave... Uh, my husband a warning. I was like, you may not like this because there's a lot of like breaking bones in the beginning and like squishy sounds. Like the sound editing is really good. And in in my mind, that's like an example of the grotesque, like unfortunate, but true. And I think that it's important to kind of pepper that in because it's not, it's never solely clean and whitewashed and everything like that. And um, some of my current experimentations deal a lot more with um, this super fun timeline we're on, um, unfortunate realities. Um, you know, I've said more, more than once this week, I can't believe we're dealing with this again, um, and, and things like that. And I think that there's a lot of kind of like, OK, let's rest up, let's hydrate back in it, you know, for everything, like the uncomfortable grotesque of reality. And then you have a little break, and you have some ice cream when you get back in it. But yeah, I, I think so. And I, I'm an advocate of the ice cream. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I mean, I think there's a, a really fine line between beauty and grotesquery. And I mean, if I can't remember the artist, maybe you know, but he did a whole series of so-called beautiful American women, or models, I think, women models. And he took all the features that models use and really exaggerated them and created these grotesque images. Um, and you know, so beauty and grotesque, grotesquery are, they're, they're the same thing, really. You can't have one without the other. And what's beautiful to someone might be completely grotesque to someone else. Um, spiders are a case in point, you know. Um, they're gorgeous, but to other people, they're grotesque. So some of this is perception. perception. Um, and I think the, the danger 
where where the the true nihilism lies is in trying to sanitize everything to make it neither beautiful nor grotesque but acceptable and i think that's what ai yep, does absolutely. right is it, it makes a flawless paper let's say but there's no soul to it so it doesn't do grotesque things it doesn't do beautiful things it does acceptable things and that i think is that's you know that's the inner circle of hell <laughs> when, when it's just sanitized and acceptable. Like, like the grotesque doesn't have to equal gratuitous. It can just be uncomfortable. And I think that mm -hmm. there's been a lot in the last few years even that are like, let's get uncomfortable um, talking about things we don't want to talk about or trying to embrace a new ideology or, or understand a different point of view or something. I think that there's a lot of importance in that discomfort right. right and i think that artists particularly love the grotesque um, i i think so i mean you, you read a book and there are three characters and two are fine and the third isn't and that's the one you know that the artist the writer loves <laughs> that that's the guy i want to focus on because he's not you know acceptable there's something interesting and um across the the grain about this character so i'm going to focus on him and i think that's what art i mean look at visual art too so much of that is focused on the grotesque i mean bosch right um, just yeah from early on just people love that kind of fascination with the ugly i was i was just looking at um uh, the Getty Museum right now has a exhibit. Uh, gosh, I'm forgetting who it is, but uh, it was a um, painting of a worker in the field, and it got a terrible, terrible reception at the time. There, and I want to say your 19th century, um, because they felt the person was ugly, and um, it was it was horribly um, just common, you know. And I, I think that there was some of that there too just an early impressionist painting where you're just trying to capture um this is the, the common person it's not you know pretty and stylized and whatnot so i think that yes we for a long time have been as artists aiming towards let me shine a light on this let me bring this out from the shadows so I was just going to ask you, um, the word re research had come up, and, and you were talking about um, writing about a goat. You wanted to look something up about it. And your poems had the you know scientific description in some places. And I guess I'm, and you had made that comment about Hemingway sort of getting something wrong. I guess I was just wondering what your thoughts are about in poetry, like the responsibility to accuracy of um, you know details um, or research versus imagination and um, that territory well I think the research challenges the imagination and is the takeoff point for the imagination so I guess what I would do is I'd run across something interesting and then think about, well, what would it be like to be that animal or that human in that situation? Um, so I want to get everything right to begin with as the foundation so then the imaginative part can take off from there. So to me, that they're, they're complementary, I guess. They're not in conflict. Um, and being truthful can lead to greater imaginative leaps because you have a form to follow um, and there's pressure and tension for the imagination. Um, if you just can do whatever you want, I think your, your writing can fall flat because there's nothing holding you to be honest. Um, I happen to live with someone who will tell me something's wrong. I mean, he knows everything. So, 
I say that that didn't happen in 1959. That was 1960 or whatever, you know. So it's nice to have a fact checker in your own house too. <laughs> but but then the the imagination takes over, and the empathy, which I think is the big part of reading and writing, is empathy. I think I think. Um you know, we were talking yesterday about um, translation and truth and translation, and and a lot of that when you have different translators translating from a, a, another language, it can come off not feeling true, um, like you all were talking about yesterday. Um, and you can have preferences for one or the other, like oh well, I just can feel that more. And I think that there's a lot of that in any kind of poetry that you have this visceral connection. Um, for sure, I've written about things or places that I didn't experience or I've never been to. Um, and I think what we're all trying to tap into it in writers is to be able to connect the dots between the subject matter that you're writing about and, and your writing to the person who's going to read it. Because all of us as poets, unless we're just writing and like burning it up, we want someone to read it. We want to have a third party involved. And I think what we're trying to do is to magic that connection. Like, I'm going to think of something, and I'm going to describe it to you, and I want you to get the goosebumps that I do when I think about it. And that's, like, the biggest win, right? When, when you have someone who's like, oh, my God, that made me feel, you know, blank. Um, at the same time, I think that when we don't read poetry carefully enough, um, we can kind of lose the point of that. My, my husband um, is from Montana, grew up, um, went to U of M undergrad, um, and I have shared with him, you know, Richard Hugo poems from bars that we've, we've, we've been to, you know, not together, but we've both been to. Um, and he'll be like, yeah, that's exactly how that bar was. I don't get it. I'm like, that's not the point. You know, you've been there, I get it. Um, and then he'll tell me some anecdote from his own life. It's like, yeah, well, I went there. I'm like, that's not the point. Again, he captured it so well that someone who hasn't been there is going to get it. And he's like, oh, right. OK, yeah. sorry, I forgot. And I'll write stuff like, we'll go and do something. And he'll be like, yep, I was with you. And I did, we did that. I'm like, OK, <laughs> hold the phone. You know, so sometimes it's like, you got to like, can we get the motor running a little bit in the poem? And you know, he's, but he's like the best editor because of that. Because I'll be like, okay, I need to work on this. I need to make it transcend just the being there, painting, like describing the photo kind of kind of thing. And I think that's really important too. Um, and and I write about stuff that I do and I and don't, and I hope that they come off kind of similarly. I want them both to have the same stuff working within them. Um, does that answer your question? Kind of. Okay, we'll go with that. We'll go with kind of. I have a follow-up question about empathy, and I'm curious if there's a process to develop that empathy, or if it's something you were able to tap into, um, you know, organically. I think I always worry that do I have a right to write about X, Y, and Z? Um, I don't want to go into something wearing a costume of someone who's experienced something. Um, I want to try to shine a light on it, like I'd said. And, and I want to bring empathy from the outside in, I think. Um, I think it's important to try to translate other people's experiences or um, what their thoughts or feelings in a way that is valid and not like I'm going to take on this trauma because it's really trendy right now, you know? Um, and I think that with both of ours writing about nature or interaction, we're trying to like piece it, piece it together or, or take it apart, you know, and understand it better. And hopefully that little bit of meditation can also translate to someone reading it. Well, I feel kind of guilty sometimes about writing from the point of view of animals, because obviously I don't know what an animal's feeling. Um, so to me, it's an exercise in developing empathy. I'm not really trying to be the swordfish, because I, you know, what right have I got to put words in the swordfish's mouth? But it's a human talking like a swordfish, I guess, or attempting to, which it, to me is practice. I mean, if, if you 
you can't look at something and immediately have empathy for it, you know. But if you start thinking about it, working with it, um, imagining its point of view, even an inanimate object, a chair in this room, it's, you know, it's just a chair. We sit on and we don't really even think about it. But what's it like to be that chair? Is that chair lonely when the audience leaves? I mean, you could write a novel about a chair, the point of view of the chair. It doesn't mean you're really the chair, but you're, you're trying to expand your imagination and the, the sense of the world being animate, I think, which is important because I think then it develops your own ethical sense. And then you won't do things. Like my mother was always telling me, you know, don't ruin your shoes. I can't afford to get you a new pair. If I had thought about it from the point of view of the shoes, like, geez, I don't want, you know, my soles to be wrecked up, you know, that sort of thing, I would take better care of them. And then I'd probably help some poor person who's in a shoe factory, you know, not have to manufacture shoes gratuitously. You know, so everything is connected, I think. And um, I, it's just empathy is a, is a tool that we can use to improve ourselves and to improve the world. And poetry, art, novels, that's the best way to do that practice, I, as far as I know, um, you know, is through that. Yeah, I think what's fascinating talking about empathy is, and it sounds like, I'm not sure if you're also doing it, but you certainly have, talk, have used the persona poem. And I think when you enter the, when you use the persona poem in a way that is, you know, where you've done your research, where you really have entered a situation or it's a narrative that's in your head and it's respectful, through the embodying of it, I believe you really can create empathy. I think that's one of the, the gifts that we do have the imagination to enter someone else's life or an animal's experience. We really can. And I think through that, empathy can come uh, to the fore. So I think it's really, um, I do think you have a right to write the persona poem. <laughs> Did you ever have a mom who said, not to write in books because books are our friends. Did anyone else have a parent who's like, don't bend that corn, books are our friends. You treat them nice. You know, you don't, you know, I think it was just a way to not get library fines, but, and to be like responsible with things. But like, books are our friends. And that's, that's also like, our shoes are our friends. Don't make me have to buy you new shoes. Yeah. We're almost out of time. Yeah, we're getting there. I have one more question, if that's all right. Go for it. Um, so we were talking about nature and that idea of, you know, the bee doesn't want to hurt you, but you, you still might get stung. And I'm thinking, you know, nature has this capacity to really interrupt our complacency, our sense of comfort. Is there a complacency or a sense of comfort that you're trying to confront through your poetry? That was a really good question. Um, I'm going to tap you while I think about it. Um, uh, I think that the act of writing can be an act of protest against complacency. Um, I have talked to a lot of people about how I don't really have a great writing like regimen. I am a very undisciplined writer, um, and I kind of have to create homework for myself. And I think that I have found the more time I have spent reading and writing poetry in my life, I have slowed down time for my brain, for myself, and found moments that I don't even realize how enjoyable they are. Um, I will look back at a poem and not remember writing it. Um, I like to say I go into some weird fugue state, and I do not recall what led from one word to the other. And that's kind of magic. And I want to put that in a bottle for myself. And they, the, the bottle really is just writing more poetry. So I think that even if you're writing bad poetry, write poetry. Even if you're writing bad fiction, write bad fiction. Like the act of writing is in itself something new that you are creating and um, share it with somebody that 
will be a great fact checker or editor um, and then see where it goes. And so that's that's my best anecdote or uh, uh, answer to that. Well, I think there are all sorts of complacencies that we fight all the time as writers, as readers. You know, I mean, we say, oh, I really like to read that kind of book. So try reading a different kind of book, you know, or I really like to write that kind of poem well. So then try to challenge yourself to not write that kind of poem, to do something else. And the more you can kick yourself out of just whatever, you know, rut and way of looking at the world you're used to, then the better, you know. And I think that a lot of what we were probably trying to do, I can't really speak for Anne, but um, the usual ways that we look at the world, at nature, you know, we'll turn it upside down. You know, what if, what if humans don't have dominion? What if a spider does? What if a tick does? What, you know, a trigger fish? Um, how does that change your life? How does that change how you look at things and how you act in the future? And to me, it all goes back to the ethical sense that, you know, the, the, the less complacent we are, the more likely we're to be ethical people. Because if you just, you cherry pick your facts, you cherry pick, you know, your opinions, and you don't ever confront real things, then you're not gonna grow as a human being, and you're not gonna do what's right, so. I mean, I, I feel very, a, a, a duty to, I guess, write without that sort of complacency. One have one last question. Thanks for all the talking so far. <laughs> um, I was wanted to come back to AI and like I think it's something I've been grappling with is like how to not just like push AI as like this is bad because like AI is not going anywhere. And like if we're talking about nature, like how to integrate thinking about AI and technology into whatever, nature, the beauty, the grotesque. So like, what does that look like for both of you? Um, I think I think finding AI in places that you haven't realized it already is is very important. Like I was mentioning the, the bird ID app, or the Cornell um, bird um, ID. I, th I cannot remember the name of it, but it's, it's by Cornell University, I believe, and, and they have some amazing, you literally hold it up and you can listen to bird song and it will identify it in real time. And it takes your location and adds that in. Of course, it's going to be like, maybe this, and it's wrong. But um, I think that getting used to little ways in which it helps us and understanding, OK, how is that functioning? That is a diagnostic tool. Um, it's also kind of um, you can like log the birds, and it can be a crowd or a what do they call it, citizen scientist kind of tool. Like you're putting in data back and they're saying, no, this isn't right. Um, or looking at how nature is surviving despite the algorithm. Um, migration happens. We don't really know why. Like, that's really cool. Like, the more that we learn about what is happening outside of, um, within this natural cyclical uh, world that we live in, depressing or not, like the more that we understand it, I think is proof that we are affecting things for better, for worse, um, that we have agency and that, um, that AI is right now functioning in a way that helps us to understand it. Um, and I think that that's, that's one way we can kind of grapple with it is like, taking a step back and be like, how am I using this or how is it functioning? And do I want it? Like, if you are using AI to create art and then say, hey, I made art, not helpful. Like, it's, it could be though, um, hey, I used AI to come up with 57 ways of looking at a cat and now I'm gonna write a poem about one of those. Or I'm gonna, you know, think about like, yeah, what would a purple cat feel like? You know, and that's how we should 
in my opinion, um, defeated in a way and, and show their humanity throughout it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I just wanted to add, um, I think that it's scary because most of us don't know how it works. And we feel like we don't have control. So what you're saying is to take some control and use it to help you, use it as a tool. And I, just, I'm, I was thinking, sort of flashing back to, you know, like whoever first napped stone and, and made an arrowhead. And imagine everybody saying, well, now we can't, you know, hunt the way we used to because there's this thing <laughs> that somebody's developed. I mean, you know, tools that just come on the scene are always scary. And they've probably always been so. And so how do we overcome that I, that sense of they're going to take over our lives? I think we take it back, you know, and, and probably try not to see it as separated from nature because we're part of nature. So maybe the world evolved us just so we could evolve AI and <laughs> or whatever it, it was that the world wanted that you know, needed humans to make, you know. Um, so, so I think that's wise to to see it as a tool that you can use and not some some sci-fi thing that's gonna crash through your walls or something like that. So, yeah, I think I think the real key is asking questions always, and that's I think what what both of us do with our with our poems and our and our creative work is just asking those questions and and you know when it comes to stuff that isn't about art or um, you know, that is maybe out of our realm, asking questions of people who have control over it. Um, AI is used in medicine a lot as a diagnostic tool right now, and it's always regulated um, through other agencies like the FDA. And I think that holding other, you know, groups accountable within their sphere of expertise and saying, should we really be using that? You know, um, I think it's, it's a really good idea and not just like open arms. So I think that's what um, we come down with when we talk about research and things like that. Just like, we're going to ask questions. We're going to learn as much as we can. And that's really fun and nerdy and, you know, just a good time. Thanks. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, we have the author's works for sale at the Fact and Fiction table, so if you haven't picked one up yet, please do. Uh, if you're interested in any merch, the info table is right outside the door. And thank you so much for supporting the Montana Book Festival. We will also be sitting out there signing if you want us to sign your book. <laughs> <laughs>